about a man by the name of Judge Charles B. Pineo. Some people may know the name, some people may not, but hopefully by the end of this talk you will know of Judge Pineo. To begin, a resolution uh, defining the harbor management jurisdiction over the waters of Bar Harbor, which are currently under control of Goolsboro. Now you know that all the Porcupine Islands, including Bar Island, are not anything to do with Bar Harbor. They all are owned by Goolsboro. And under an agreement made in the 1700s, the boundary between the two towns were drawn just a few hundred yards off the shores of Bar Harbor. Even though the communities are separated by over five miles of water in Frenchman's Bay. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Bar Island, which is connected to Bar Harbor by a quarter mile long gravel bar at low tide, is within spitting distance of the busy and sometimes boisterous summer life of Bar Harbor. <laughs> but it's actually in the town of Goldsboro. The original agreement gave control over all of Porcupine Islands to Goldsboro. And during the 1700s, Bar Island was shown on maps as Bar Porcupine Island. Mm -hmm. Now, there are names, and you'll, you'll know that some of the people that are from here, shall I say, um, you know, the older generation will call it Rhodex Island or Bar Island. But on the old maps, it was Bar Porcupine. Mm. Now, Madame de Gregoire, who was the granddaughter of, of Cadillac, and of course, when I always used to um, give tours at 33, Ledgelon, um, to the school children, I used to say when uh, Cadillac came here, you know, he, he followed behind Sir de Mont. And uh, I, say, I would say to the children, where did Cadillac go? You know, he left. He didn't stay here for long, so where did he go? And the children would always look at me and say, oh, I don't know. I said, well, have you ever heard of Detroit, Michigan? They got the car and we got the mountain. <laughs> So, uh, Madame de Gregoire was the granddaughter of Cadillac. And the original, she originally held the title to all of Mount Desert Island. And, but Cadillac's deed was erased in 1712 by the Treaty of Utrecht, which ceded control of the area to the British. The British placed the area under the control of Governor Bernard. And you've heard of Bernard on the other side of the island, part of, you know. So some of these names you'll be familiar with. Following the American Revolution, Madame de Gregoire, she pressed a claim for the return of her grandfather's holdings. To the beneficial role of the French during the Revolution, a Massachusetts court, which under jurisdiction over what is now the main coast, made Madame de Gregoire an American citizen and settled her claim. The court awarded Madame de Gregoire the eastern half of Mount Desert Island and all other islands and tracts of land, particularly described in the grant or patent of the late most Christian magistrate, Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. And to said Monsieur de la Monte Cadillac. This document was signed in June of 1787 and gave ownership of Bar Island to Madame de Gregoire. Now, Daniel Rodick, this is where the Rodicks come in. Now, Madame de Gregoire was here and she's now finally got back the claims and everything. But Daniel Rodick and his wife Betty Hamer, and if you aren't from here and you see H-A-M-O-R, it's not Hammer, it's Hamer. Were married in Hartswell in 1767, and they settled on the shores of Hulse Cove in 1769. They raised a large family, and their third child was David Rodick. Now, the, my family has a lot of Johns and Jimmies. You have to realize what generation you're in. This particular family of the Rodicks, there were a lot of Davids and Daniels, so you have to go back to how many generations you're going back. Now, before 1814, Daniel Rodick, he had acquired his land in House Cove and Bar Island. The, bar, the deed for Bar Island is unrecorded but it's known that he bought, Daniel bought it from Madame de Gregoire. So now we have, Madame de Gregoire has turned over uh, Bar Island to become Rodick's Island. And it was David Rodick, Rodick Jr. who built up a fishing business on Bar Island. He built large wares to catch herring and those were the days of the big fishing boats. I have a lovely picture here of the old-fashioned wares they used to have out here in Frenchman's Bay. 
the big fishing boats were bound for the Grand and the Georgian banks, and they would come in here to get barrel after barrel of herring for bait. When the fish were running, and that's why I told you it was a high, there's a high point on Bar Island, because when the fish were running, there would be a flag raised on the pole on the top of Bar Island, and that would indicate to the fishermen if the herring and everything was ready for them to come to get their bait. The fish house, which was two stories high and probably 80 by 200, <laughs> A small car ran on a track from the ocean into one end of this building on the ground level. The floor was two and a half feet from the ground, so the fish would dump off the car directly onto the floor. The bait had to be iced, as did the fish caught on the banks. So when David Jr. thought, that's when he went into the ice business. A large crew of men were employed to cut ice at Witch Hole and Eagle Lake. Then the long sledges to the ice houses in Bar Harbor. They were located on the opposite shores of Bar Island. And here were the big blocks of ice that were stored in sawdust to await the fishermen. Large racks of fish were dried and salted in the smokehouse. Long strings of herring were smoked. And it was from this business that David Jr. had the finances to build the huge, big Rhotic House. Now the Rhotic House, today, um, it had about 600 rooms, and there was one room in the front they always called the fish pond, because they said that's where the women would go and check out the men. <laughs> But to give you an idea, the, the Rhotic House started in 1866, and it was built in three different sections. And it lasted from 1866, it was torn down in 1906. And it ran from what I know as a child as Gonya's Corner, but you perhaps know it as um, right next to um, where the Chamber of Commerce has a building now, across from Ben and Bill's, that new building next to Willis's, and it went right from that corner all the way to where Stone Soup was at one point last year. So it really had, took in a, practically a whole city block, that one uh, hotel. So, and Carol Brown, Carol Brown always told me the story. I used to listen to a lot of the older people telling stories of Bar Harbor, and he, Carol Brown, told me the story about Harold Carter, who worked at the bank, but he, and times, he would go over to the Rhotic House to work, and he'd take a broom, and he, he would uh, sweep the porch of the Rhotic House, which he never could do in one day, because the porch at the Rhotic House was so long and wide. So it would take him several days to do the porch at the Rhotic House. Now, Eugenia Rodick Martin, who wrote this very interesting book on the counting of the, of the life on Bar Island, she wrote that her generation did not actually live on the island. She had two brothers, David and Serenus Rodick, and they were both lawyers in Bar Harbor. And they would go out there at different times. Jack and Mary Jo Perkins, and perhaps you know him from CNN. He was a, um, like the correspondent on that and did a lot on the A&E channels. Um, they took the uh, accounting and, and did this book on Parasol Severn. Now, Flora Rodick, she marries a man by the name of Charles B. Pinio. And that's where you get the Rodics coming in on the Pineo line. And uh, Flora, was, she was the one that managed the house. She managed all the affairs of the house. She did the woodlots. She, uh, she made sure that people were working in the kennels, the stables, gardens, everything. She was the one that was instrumental in keeping everything under lock and key, so to speak. In the summer, when the gardens were at the height, it was a busy time in the kitchen over there at Bar Island. Big pans of peas and corn and all garden products were brought in every day to be canned, preserved, pickled, or salted. In the fall is when the pigs were killed. All year round, there was the milk to take care of twice a day. 
churning twice a, twice a week, chickens and ducks to be pick, uh, picked and cleaned for Sunday dinner, beans and brown bread for Saturday night, and Sunday mornings hot bread, and at least two times a day clam chowder, clam pies, bird stew, dumplings, strip fish with baked potatoes and salt pork scraps, fried crisp and brown, mush and milk, fish cakes, and hot spicy gingerbread. So they lived there growing their own vegetables, having pigs, cows, chickens, and ducks. But one thing they had that you'll never surmise was sheep. Hmm. They had sheep, but where did they keep their sheep? On sheep porcupine. <laughs> sheep porcupine. Now, the porcupines basically are all over by the Canadian National Park, right? Wrong. Sheep porcupine is owned by a very dear friend of mine who lives in Nevada. The porcupine islands are all owned except sheep porcupine. That's the only one that's not owned by the park. And uh, so they used to send out the the sheep, and then they would bring them in, and they would spin the, their wool for um, and for yarn and cloth and whatever. We have a blanket that was made from the wool of uh, uh, from Bar Island. It's blue and white, and they had many, many kennels on Bar Island. They had about two hundred dogs. Judge Pinio was a breeder of pointer dogs. And the famous dog, the stud dog, was Rip Rat. <laughs> he was the famous dog. Norm Shaw gave this to the Historical Society. And I was thrilled to death with it because it's just, of course, being a lover of dogs anyway, I was just thrilled to death to have that. But he is. Uh, related to the Pineos. So that's how he acquired Rip Rat. Now, the dog lines over there, he had so many, you know, about 200 dogs, but that was very, very important to Pineo, with breeding of these pointer dogs, that not only genealogy, but dog lines for, for the uh, breeding of dogs to go back to see where they, you know, who their parents were of the dogs. And David Rodick, as I mentioned, was a lawyer. Here he is, surrounded by offspring of Rip Rat. <laughs> and my grandfather, Leroy Harriman, um, he bred dogs with Pinia. And my mother always told the story um, that they lived down at Port Eagle Mary Road. And when the dogs would be um, noisy or whatever out in the pens at Port Eagle Mary Road, right in the center of town, so to speak, my grandfather would just whistle, my mother said, and the dogs just quieted right down. There wasn't another word. I, you know, I don't have that mad. Um, but just to show you is, is a picture of my mother's brother, my uncle, John Harriman here. And with him is Ben and Beulah, the two dogs. And Ben was the offspring of Rip Rat. And so therefore, um, my grandfather was bred these dogs with Pinio, and um, they were very, very um, important to Judge Pinio. In the 1880s, the Canoe Club was located on the north northwest side of Bar Island. And it had been used for dances and parties and served as headquarters for canoeing. Several Indians had been employed as teachers, and it was generally a flourishing establishment. And it was built on land, the Canoe Club was built on land that was loaned by the Rodics. It survived until about the 1920s, and it no longer was uh, viable over there as the Canoe Club. 
Now, Mrs. Martin writes that they always loved to picnic out there on the high porch of the deserted club. She continued to state that many times my brothers David and Serenus and I would, were overcome by the urge to go to the island when the tide was high. We would go to the foot of the bar at Bridge Street and we'd go there and just yell to Uncle Milk Rodick for, to come for us in a boat as if he had anything else to do. <laughs> Sometimes all men were busy in the fish house and the distance to the island from where we were was about a quarter of a mile. No matter how busy Aunt Milt Rodick was, we always went, went to the island, we never kept. So as you can see from this little short uh, bit here, you can see that from this Bar Island was basically a self-contained community in itself. They could live out there and whatever they did, they were, everything was right there for them. Now, Charles B. Pinio, he was the largest real estate holder in Bar Harbor at the time. He owned some 400 acres in Bar Harbor and 15 stores. Now, I know for a fact my mother's friend owned a drugstore in town. And you would think that years ago when you buy a building, that you buy the building and whatever. He bought the building, but he didn't own the land. The land was owned by the town. So the town was still collecting money from these businesses. So I, what they do now, I don't know. But in other words, he owned 15 stores at the time. and. And he sold 30 acres on the west side of Bar Island to E.T. Stokesbury, and we'll get into that, for $100,000 in 1909. Wow. A bridge to Bar Island almost became a reality in 1909, as at a special town meeting in February of 1906 that the idea was presented to Bar Harbor which was then called Eden until 1916, voters by Charles Pinio, who owned four-fifths of the island. At a March meeting, Mr. Pinio presented the details of the project, which he estimated would cost around $23,000. Mrs. Slater, Mrs. Horatio Slater, she owned another house on the island at the time, and she uh, had, uh, was the fifth owner. Uh, and was opposed to the idea of a bridge. She reported to the meeting in May, the committee had come to the conclusion that a causeway would be the most practical structure that would cost 35 to 45,000. The idea was brought before the 1909 meeting, and evidently there was nobody there from the town of Poolsboro. A motion to build the, a, a bridge though was finally passed. All came to a halt when July 27th brought an injunction from a group of citizens. A group of six summer residents headed by John S. Kennedy. He was president of Pennsylvania Railroad at the time. He wished to prevent the building of such a structure. So on August 30th, all decisions were abruptly taken out of the hands of the voter when E.T. Stokesbury, president of Drexel and Company of Philadelphia, purchased 40 acres on the west side of the island, the price to be said to have been well over $100,000. This brought an end of any probability of building a bridge unless Mr. Stokesbury himself decided to build. At the time of the purchase, Many people in town expected Mr. Stokesbury would build a much larger and a more elaborate estate on Bar Island than any could be found in Bar Harbor. Because, as you know, Mr. Stokesbury was the one that owned Wingwood, which um, was where the Blue Nose Ferry is now. And they had come to town um, and had purchased from the Cassatts four acres, which they tore down. The Stokesbury's came here. He had been married before, and she had been married before. And um, they joined and, and had a place called Wingwood, 40 rooms for their servants. 
So, in other words, it was uh, quite elaborate. So everybody in the town was worried, is this going to be something we're going to be faced with on Bar Island? And so some people had visions of dozens of other summer homes being built among the tall trees on the island, but Bar, Bar Island remained as it was. And seven years after Mr. Stokesbury's death in 1945, the western part of the island was purchased by John D. Rockefeller and donated it to Acadia National Park. Following many transfers of property on the eastern part of the island and the building of one cottage there, 25 acres were bought by the park in 1989 for one million. So that all of our island now is owned by Acadia National Park. And here is the paper where it went for auction on August 24th. And what Rockefeller saw, <clears throat> this being the part where he decides that to save this area and purchases that for all of us. So we get to the part now of a man by the name of Henry Buxton who wrote a book in 1938 entitled Assignment Down East. It's very good. It tells a lot about this, um, a lot of people back in, in that time. Um, and he particularly chose uh, Charles B. Pinio. And he had practically devoted his life to the development of Mount Sir. Not many people really hear about Judge Pinio uh, with devoting his life. We always hear about Charles Elliott, George, uh, George B. Dorr, and, um, you know, John D. Rockefeller. We always hear of those three people that were in, influential in establishing this. But now we get to the idea Judge Pinio is coming to light. And, uh, but it says in 1903, Judge Pinio, George B. Dorr, and Charles Elliott, and other prominent men secured legislative authority to acquire and hold in the public interest land on Mount Desert Island. The Pinios originated from Italy, and they migrated to France, became Huguenots, and then driven to England, driven out to, and to England, and then to America. His maternal grandmother was English. And his maternal grandmother's husband was Captain Doty, who died mid-ocean. And his maternal grandmother took command of the ship and navigated it to St. John, Canada. The British government, in recognition of her courage, presented her a tract of land which later became St. Stephen, New Brunswick, Canada. The widow of Captain Doty married Jonathan Pinio. And the two of them drove from Canada by ox team to Machias and Harrington, where Charles Pinio was born. He came to, him, uh, to Bar Harbor. He went to law school, uh, and he, came to, uh, he went to law school, admitted to the main bar in 1897. He practiced law in Bar Harbor for over 30 years. But the one interesting thing is, too, is his name, we all know, is Charles B. Pinion. But his maternal grandmother's uh, husband, maternal grandmother was English, and her cousin was Lord Byron. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you get Charles Byron Pinion. Judge Pinion stated that when he settled in Bar Harbor, the property valuation was... $200,000. Mm -hmm. And in 1938, it was in excess of $7 million. I called the town office yesterday. I said, what's Bar Harbor's valuation now? $1.9 billion. <laughs> A little bit different than the $200,000. <laughs> uh, Henry Buxton further stated in his book in 1938 that Judge Pinio said, quote, that those of us that were really interested in the proper development of Bar Harbor realized that something must be done to preserve this natural wonderland for posterity. We did not like the thought that the time was not too far distant when these incomparable mountain tops would be disfigured with the keep off signs of private owners. We felt these beautiful acres jeweled with fresh water lakes and bounded to the eastward by the tumbling Atlantic 
with the natural heritage of the American people and should be incorporated into a park where they should be available to every loving citizen. We formed a group of eight with Charles Elliott as chairman, the prime mover, George B. Dorr. And at the time, he was 80 years old. It was due almost entirely to Mr. Dorr's tireless activity that we received authority from the legislature to buy and hold land in the interest of the public. Now, this initial effort was result in the establishment of a national park that is second to none in the United States for sheer beauty. So Judge Pineo, or as we now know, Charles Byron Pineo, could see back in 1938, for Harbor would become a thriving resort. He helped to develop the national park for all to enjoy to this day. The buildings of the old Rodick farm are long gone, as are those of the homes of the Slaters and Jack and Mary Jo Perkins. Each day, many folks cross the bar, we watch them from here, to venture onto Bar Island, not knowing that years ago, the island was such a thriving place to visit. Thank you. Wendy, would you like to take some questions? Oh, I can answer them. <laughs> How did Perkins get hooked up with uh, Bar Island? I know he lived there for a while. But... Jack came here, and uh, the, the, he found that there was a certain acreage there. He called it Moosewood, because I didn't of the wood that was over there, or is there. And uh, he bought that special section right there. But you see, he had to have generator power. He had to have everything that was self-sufficient for him. Because they didn't, you know, didn't have as much there as the Rodex did to have the big establishment. So, but he, uh, they moved from here and went to uh, Florida. And Jack has since passed away, but Mary Jo sent a note not too long ago. Didn't he, didn't he do the uh, introduction to the park? You know, yeah, he did a lot of the videos. Yeah, he did a lot of uh, Jeff Dobbs' videos. Because he was very interested and very much, uh, he had that voice that would project very well from being on TV for so, so many years. Yes? Do you know what kind of pointers they raised over there? No, all I know is uh, that they were the pointer dogs. And um, in this article here, it just says that... Uh, uh, he was a, a pointer named Bueller, and Ben was the setter. Okay. And, uh, but he was very much into the uh, dogs, for basically for the hunting for the rusticators. Okay. And they would leave them here. In the wintertime, some would take them back with them. And, uh, but most of the time that they would be breeding them here, and, uh, and then they would be buying them to take them elsewhere or leave them here for the winter. Do you know if they're still breeding dogs from that lineage? That I don't. That I don't. Yeah. Because it, uh, you know, he was the famous stud dog and, and whomever. You know, we got this, a lot of the uh, Rodick information we got when Dave Rodick's daughter died and uh, in Florida. And we got a lot of stuff from, from them. And um, but by that time, Lord only knows where the line had gone, unfortunately. Yeah. And how many places around the island were they able to access by boat? Any besides right here? Mrs. Slater had a pier. Mrs. Slater had a pier, so she could uh, obviously do her own. And she was more, if you're looking directly at Fire Island from uh, the pier, hers was more over on the right-hand side. And the rodents were over on the left side. There's a small postal card here showing the back end of the old uh, Far Harbor Club, but you saw uh, some of the fish houses and stuff in the, in the, in the uh, opening of the, of the meadows there on Rodex Island, Bar Island. Anybody? 
Jim, don't you have a question? <laughs> you know, you've been very thorough, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have another question that you think of for Debbie, please feel free to go up and ask her. Uh, give us just a moment to move the table, and then we welcome you to have some refreshments on the piazza. So thank you again, Debbie.